Hello, this is Wayne Conrad from the Good Shepherd Church, and I'm reading today chapter 6, John Frame's book, Salvation Belongs to the Lord, an introduction to systematic theology, which we're using in an informal theology discussion class on Saturdays and Sundays. Today's chapter is What is Theology? To know God is to know Him as Lord, and therefore to pursue knowledge of Him in a godly way. As we come to know God, we recognize that He initiates our knowledge, that His Word is the ultimate authority for our knowledge, and that in knowing God we come into a personal relationship with Him. Theology is the application of Scripture to all areas of human life. Exegetical, biblical, and systematic theology look at the whole Bible from various perspectives. Now we're going to spend one chapter exploring the nature of theology, and you're probably surprised that we're doing this so late in the book. Most theologies deal with this subject right at the beginning, and we're going to understand why. It seems that you need to have a definition of theology before you can do theology, but that's not necessarily true. You can usually walk before you can define walking, and talk before you can define talking. The work of defining is a fairly sophisticated human activity. Most people don't learn how to define terms until they're in school, and most of us never learn how to do that well. In general, activity precedes definition. In our case, I think it's been helpful to wait a few chapters before defining theology for two reasons. In the first place, it's just good in principle for you to have some experience doing theology before you try to define it. And second, if you're going to understand my definition of theology, you need to know something about God's covenant lordship. By the way, definitions are not something to live or die over. The Bible doesn't tell us how to define English words. The word theology isn't even in the Bible, so we are faced with a number of choices as to how to use it, if we want to use it at all. Any definition is okay if it enables us to communicate clearly with one another and doesn't prevent us from saying something that needs saying. I'd like to suggest here are two ways of looking at theology. I know it's odd to have two ways instead of three. Maybe one of you can write to me and suggest a third. But for now we have two. Theology is knowing God, and theology is a disciplined study of God. First, theology is knowing God. This definition was given by Abraham Kuyper, the great Dutch Christian philosopher, theologian, journalist, politician, and founder of the Free University of Amsterdam. Kyber was one of the giants of Reformed theology in the last two centuries. He was Prime Minister of the Netherlands from 1901 to 1905. He wrote thousands and thousands of pages, but I'd urge you to read first his Lectures on Calvinism. In that book, he shows that Calvinism is not just a system of theology, but has implications for philosophy, the arts, politics, all of culture. His most famous saying was that there is not one square inch of territory in the universe of which Jesus Christ does not say, this is mine. Well, Kuyper said that theology is knowing God. When you take apart the word theology, you get theo from the Greek word for God and ology from the Greek word logos. Logos can mean a lot of things, word, reason, account, or knowledge. Knowing God is not what, not what we usually think of when we hear the word theology, but it is one of the generally accepted definitions of the term. If you say that theology is knowing God, you make it a personal activity rather than a merely academic one. Knowing God is something more than knowing about God. It is a personal relationship, like knowing a friend or knowing an enemy. I've been emphasizing in this book the importance of seeing God as an absolute person. Recall that biblical religion is unique in teaching that the supreme being is personal. To think of theology as knowing God underscores this emphasis. In John 17, 3, in his prayer to the Father, Jesus says, And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Eternal life, in the final analysis, is nothing more or less than knowing God. Eternal life is entering into a friendship with God, one that deepens and grows through all eternity. People will sometimes say, how can people like me actually know God, the great Lord of the universe? Some think we are arrogant to even claim that we know God. It is true that God is greater than we are, even incomprehensible. 
In Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says that his thoughts are not our thoughts, nor his ways our ways. And Paul in Romans 11, 33 through 36 says that God's judgments are unsearchable and his ways past finding out. But though God is incomprehensible, he is also knowable. He is knowable because he reveals himself to us as we have seen in the last two chapters. We couldn't figure out on our own who he is, but he has come into our world and has told us who he is. So we know him who is incomprehensible. Incomprehensible means that not that God is unknowable, but that we cannot know him exhaustively, completely, as God knows himself. Indeed, even unbelievers know God in a sense. Romans 1 tells us that everyone knows God because he has revealed himself clearly in the created world. Through that revelation, people not only know about God, but they know him. However, only believers have a saving knowledge of God, the knowledge that is eternal life. See 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 15 and 1 John 5, 20. Unbelievers know God, but as an enemy, not a friend. The believer's knowledge of God is that which comes from the Father through the Son, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. That's the kind of knowledge we'd be looking at through the rest of the first section of the chapter. To know God is to know him as Lord. Over and over, God says that he will do something so that they shall know that I am the Lord. For instance, Exodus 14, 18. This is a summary of what God wants us to know about him, to know that he is Lord. That means, as we've seen in pre previous chapters, knowing his control, authority, and presence. You grow in knowledge of God as you know him more and more as Lord, as King. First, he is the one who controls all things. You will know, grow in your knowledge of God as you see more and more things as under his control, the present, the future, your own life, your sin, your salvation. Perhaps you think now that there is some part of your life where you are in control. You will grow in your knowledge of God when you come to see that ultimately there is no part of your life that is controlled by anyone other than God, even that little part of your life. Second, you come to know God as the one who speaks with such authority that you must obey in every area of your life, your social life, your moral life, even your intellectual life. You will grow in your knowledge of God when you come to bring every thought captive to Christ, 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Third, you come to know God as you sense more and more his presence in your life. You can't ever escape from him. You can't, you can't do anything that he doesn't see, and nothing shall ever separate you from his love. Our knowledge of God, as we've seen, is a knowledge about God's lordship is also a knowledge under his lordship, subject to his lordship. That is to say, we achieve knowledge about God in God's way. Knowing is one of many things we do in life, and like everything else, it should be done to God's glory. What kind of knowing brings glory to God? First, it is knowledge that is under God's control. God is the one who decides whether we will know him or not. We cannot know him unless he takes the initiative to reveal himself. God is sovereign in the area of knowledge as he's in everything else. Second, it is knowledge under God's authority. Scripture describes a very close relationship between knowing God and obedience in several ways. First, knowledge of God produces obedience, John 14, 15, and 21. If we know Christ, indeed, if we love him, we will keep his commandments. Two, obedience leads to the knowledge of God. Jesus said in John 7, 17, if anyone his will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. You see, a desire to obey leads to a knowledge that Jesus' words come from God. The obedient heart comes first, the knowledge second. And then, certainly, the new knowledge will lead to new obedience. The new obedience to still more knowledge and so on. There's a spiral relationship between knowledge and obedience. More of the one leads to more of the other. If I draw an arrow, or meaning leads to between knowledge and obedience, that arrow would have to point in both directions, knowing producing obedience and obedience producing knowledge. The second part is hard to understand. We're used to hearing people say that knowledge comes first, then ethics, knowledge first, then obedience. But the Bible remarkably teaches also that obedience leads to knowledge. Third, Scripture sometimes equates knowledge and obedience. In Jeremiah twenty-two sixteen, God speaks of a good king this way. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. 
Is not this to know me, declares the Lord? Good King Joash supported the poor against their oppressors. This was his knowledge of God. Godliness is knowledge, so there is no knowledge without godliness. This is why for obedience is a criterion of knowledge in Scripture. If you want to know whether someone knows God, look at his or her life. 1 John 2, 3, 4 reads, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Obedience and knowledge are so very close. 5. So if we're going to seek knowledge, we must do it in an obedient way. We must not seek knowledge the way the world does. God calls that foolishness. We must seek not so we can show how smart we are, but with love for people. The wisdom of God, as James says in 3.17, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. I've mentioned that our knowledge of God is under his control and under his authority. That means that we have to seek knowledge in God's way. The third lordship attribute, God's presence, is also relevant to our knowledge of God. As we seek knowledge of God, remember always that we're seeking a deep relationship with Him, one very much like marriage or sonship or friendship. The same principles apply to knowing God's world. After all, the world is God's creation, so knowing the world is knowing God. To know the world is to know God's intentions, His taste, His desires, and in some cases, His sense of humor. Think of the camel and the oak. Occupy. John Calvin wrote on the first page of his Institutes that knowing God and knowing the self are interrelated. You can't know God without knowing yourself, and you can't know yourself without knowing God. And Calvin added that he didn't know which was first. I think Calvin would say the same thing about knowing the world. To know the world, you must know God, and vice versa. So we have three terms here, God, the world, and the self. And we can't understand one of these without the others. We know God through his word, so let's replace God with his world in this word in this scheme, the word of God, the world, and the self. This triad ties in with the lordship attributes. The world is the course of nature and history under God's control. The word is authoritative revelation of God. And the self is where God dwells with us in his temple presence. You can't know God without knowing these three things, and you can't know any one of them without the others. Let me define three perspectives, which I think are very important to theology. When you ask directly what God's revelation says, you are using the normative perspective. Of course, you can't understand God's revelation apart from the world and the self. The world and the self are revelation, as we saw in chapter 4. As I said there, you cannot fully understand special revelation, general revelation, and existential revelation apart from the others. So the normative perspective focuses on God's revelation, applying it to the world and to the self. When you ask about God's world, trying to understand the situations we get into, I call that the situational perspective. Of course, you can't understand your situation without understanding God's revelation or without understanding yourself. Then when you ask about yourself, when you seek to know yourself, you're seeking to know from what I will call the existential perspective. In this perspective, you focus on yourself. Of course, you can't understand yourself apart from the Word and the world. You can't understand yourself apart from God's revelation. And you can't understand yourself apart from the situation, your environment. I call these perspectives because each of them covers the whole field of knowledge from a particular angle, a perspective. It's not that the normative covers some things, the situational others, and the existential still others. Rather, each perspective covers everything. The normative focuses on God's revelation, but it looks both at the world and the self, for everything is revelation. The situational focuses on the world, but it also looks at the word and the self, which are parts of the world. And the same is true for the existential. It focuses on the self, but it is through the self our thoughts and perspectives that we know everything else. Each of these three perspectives deals with the whole world, but does so from its peculiar, well, perspective. The situational correlatives correlates with the lordship attributes of control, for in studying the world we are studying God's mighty works of creation and providence. The normative correlates with the lordship attribute of authority, 
for his revelation is authoritative, and the existential correlates with the lordship attribute of presence, as God can always be found in and with the individual self. We've looked at theology as knowing God, knowing him as Lord, knowing him at his initiative in obedient response to his word as the one in whom we live and move and have our being. Theology is also knowing our world and knowing ourselves in relation to him through his revelation and therefore knowing him under the situational, normative, and existential perspectives. Theology is a disciplined study of God. So now let's take a second approach to theology, certainly not inconsistent with the first. Theology is a disciplined study of God. This is what most people have in mind when they use the term theology. What kind of study are we talking about? Frederick Schumacher is sometimes called the father of modern theology, modern liberal theology, that is. Liberal theology is theology that does not recognize the supreme authority of Scripture. Liberal theologians, therefore, need to find some standard other than the Bible to use in developing their theology. So Schumacher defined religious define theology this way. Quote, Christian doctrines are accounts of the Christian religious affections set forth in speech. You see what Schallmacher is doing? He does not believe that the Bible is the absolute word of God, so he prefers to say that theology is the outworking of our religious affections or feelings. You encounter God, you, you feel a certain way, and then you try to put that feeling into words. That's theology in Schallmacher's view. It's usually called a subjectivistic view because it sees theology as something that goes on inside ourselves. Very different is the definition of Charles Hodge, the great Reformed theologian who taught at Princeton Seminary for many years in the 19th century. He had a high view of biblical authority and saw Scripture as the ultimate authority for theological statements. He said that theology is the exhibition of the facts of Scripture in their proper order and relation. Hodge's definition is much better than Schallmaker's because it bases theology squarely on the Word of God. It's an objective view because it sees theology as based on something outside ourselves. But as we look at this definition carefully, we should ask what Hodge means by proper order. Proper as opposed to what? The Scriptures? It sounds as if Hodge is saying that in the Bible we fact Facts are in a disorder, or that their order is less than improper, so that it's the theologian's job to put them in proper order. But then Hodges would be criticizing Scripture, not in its content, but in its form. My guess is that Hodge would want to deny that he's criticizing Scripture in any way at all. So the words proper order probably don't reflect very well what was in Hodges' mind. The problem here is that Hodge didn't have a very clear idea of why we need theology. If Scripture is already in a proper order, then we don't need theology to put it in such an order. Then why do we need theology? So here's my suggestion. We need theology for the sake of people. Theology is the application of the word by persons to the world and to all areas of human life. We need theology not because there is something wrong with the Bible, an improper form perhaps, but because there's something wrong with us. The Bible is fine just as it is. The problem is that we're slow to grasp it, both because of our weakness and because of our sin. So the theologian, like a good preacher, takes the biblical text and explains it to us. Usually this will involve putting it into a different form rather than just reading the words to us. That is not because the Bible's own form is somewhat improper, but because other forms are sometimes useful in getting the biblical content through our thick heads. Why didn't Hodge think to put it this way? What kept him from thinking of theology's application? I'm not sure, but I suspect that Hodge would have found my definition too close to Schallmaker's, too subjective. For my definition, theologians have to talk about human needs and questions, not only about the objective word of God. Reformed theologians generally have been adverse to talking about inner subjectivity, about feelings, and inner thought processes, but I think Reformed theology needs to give more attention to the subjective side of theology. Theology, after all, is an inward process, a process of thinking. It isn't just feelings, as Schallmaker thought, but it takes account of feelings, for thoughts and feelings influence one another all the time. The Bible itself tells us that we should apply its truth to our own experiences, our questions, our feelings, and our thought processes. The Pharisees thought that they were experts in the Bible. 
but they made one huge mistake. Although they thought they understood the biblical text, they did not apply it to their own lives and to their experience of the very Son of God living in their midst. So they missed out on the whole meaning of Scripture. You can't understand the Bible unless you can use it, apply it, and the Pharisees couldn't do this. They thought they understood the normative perspective without the situational, but that's impossible. Even disciples of Jesus could make the same mistake. See Luke 24, 25. Paul says in Romans 15, 4, that the Bible, even the oldest portions of it, was written for our comfort to meet our needs in the present. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says that the purpose of the Old Testament is to make us thoroughly furnished for every good work. So the purpose of Scripture is partly subjective. It is to help us deal with situations and problems of the present time. Theology is application. The second concept of theology is very close to the first. Theology as discipline study is part of theology as knowledge of God. It's part of our discipleship, our servanthood. Theology, even as discipline study, seeks knowledge not as something to boast, but as a means of spiritual growth for the theologian and those to whom he ministers. Traditional theological programs. There are several narrow disciplines within the larger discipline of theology, which I call traditional theological programs. These include exegetical, biblical, systematic, historical, and practical theology. Exegetical theology focuses on individual passages of the scripture, verses and bits of verses, but also chapters and books. You could even write an exegetical theology that covers the whole Bible as a set of commentaries. Exegetical theology does its work by careful reading of each sentence, each word in the Bible. But if exegetical theology is theology, it must be application. So we can define exegetical theology as the application of particular passages of Scripture. Biblical theology studies the history of redemption. The Bible tells us about a series of events that constitutes our redemption. After the fall, God made covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and Jesus Christ, which brings about our salvation. He fulfills the terms of those covenants by great deliverances given to his people in history. The Exodus, return from exile, and preeminently Jesus' death, resurrection, ascension, and return. So biblical theology centers on the events the Bible narrates. If it is properly theology, biblical theology will apply those events to our lives. But then there's systematic theology, what we're doing now. Systematic theology answers questions like, what does the whole Bible teach about God or man or Christ or salvation? For example, we learn some things about salvation from Genesis and others from Exodus, the Psalms, Romans, Galatians, and so on. Systematics asks, where does it all lead? What does it all add up to? These are questions of application because they're seeking to ascertain what we should believe today based on these biblical materials and, of course, how we should behave based on our study of God's Word. So systematics, like the others, is theology, the application of God's Word to all areas of life. What about historical and practical theology? If historical theology is really theology, it aims at helping us today. It is a kind of application of Scripture. I call it the study of how Scripture has been applied to the past to help us do better in the future. It helps us to avoid the mistakes of our forefathers, and more positively, it helps us to build on their foundation rather than trying to reinvent the wheel in every generation. This is a kind of question we ask of the whole Bible. How has the whole Bible been used? So historical theology is a department of systematics. Practical theology asks how we should communicate the Word of God through preaching, teaching, counseling, worship, evangelism, missions church planning, and so on. If practical theology is really theology, it goes to the Bible in part for answers to those questions. As such, practical theology is a division of systematics. Exegetical, biblical, and systematic theology each covers the whole Bible from a different angle, a different perspective. You have to be a good exegete to be a good biblical and systematic theologian. But the opposite is also the case. You must be a good systematic theologian 
to be a good, good exegete or a biblical theologian. Yes, these three are prospectively related. And finally, I would note that all three of these labels are misnomers. Biblical theology is no more biblical than exegesis or systematics. Exegetical is no more exegetical than the others, nor systematics more systematic than the others. All three of these disciplines should be biblical, exegetical, and orderly. Method in systematic theology. Since this is a study of systematic theology, we should give some consideration to the methods of systematics. Systematics, as I said, answer questions of the form, what does the whole Bible teach about X, Y, or Z, and where X can be any topic. It can be a topic within Scripture or a topic not mentioned in Scripture. Examples of the former would be the attributes of God or the atonement or justification or sanctification. Examples of the latter would be the Trinity. Remember the word Trinity is not found in Scripture. Or abortion or nuclear war. In all these cases, we're seeking to answer questions that people, including ourselves, ask about the Bible. So in all these cases, we're doing the work of application, like all forms of theology, systematic theology, is application. To apply scripture to all these areas, we need many tools. The Bible is our the Bible itself is our chief tool, and it has the final say about everything. Indeed, it is our sufficient source of truth about God. But to understand the Bible most thoroughly, we often need to understand things outside the Bible. We need to understand Greek and Hebrew, ancient history, principles of literary interpretation, and so on. Not every believer is trained in these areas, but most believers have access to people who are trained in these areas, such as pastors, Bible teachers, authors. Each of us needs to use the tools God has given. Using such tools does not violate the sufficiency of Scripture, as we discussed in chapter 3. The sufficiency of Scripture does not forbid us to make use of extra-biblical information, even in the work of theology. Rather, it teaches us that Scripture contains all the words of God we will ever need. But to understand those sufficient divine words, we may need to make use of extra-biblical information. Furthermore, we need to understand the questions we are asking of Scripture. Often this will require an understanding of the people who ask those questions. For example, to understand the traditional question about the Lord's Supper, we need to know where the medieval and Reformed theologians were coming from. To answer questions coming from modern people, we need to know something about modern languages, history, and culture. This should not surprise us because, of course, the three perspectives are interrelated and mutually dependent. We should not lose sight of the goal, however, which is to understand what the Bible says. Here let me criticize a habit that many theologians, liberal theologians have gotten into, as well as some evangelical theologians. They write books of theology that consist mainly of history, history of past theology, and contemporary theology. Their references to the Bible are rare and almost incidental. They seek to do the work of theology simply by giving their reactions to what other theologians say. What usually happens in this approach is that a theologian will argue his case by quoting people who agree with him and by denigrating people who disagree. Often I find these references both positive and negative unpersuasive, these arguments. In fact, it almost seems as though the writer is not trying to be persuasive. Rather, he's just trying to state what he believes is comparison and contrast with other thinkers. Over against this approach, it seems to me that the important thing in systematic theology is making a case, and ultimately making a case means going back to the scriptures. It may or may not be interesting what Charlemagne or Barth or Hodge thinks about a theological question. They may be right or wrong, but at the end of it, it doesn't matter much. To decide what we must believe, we must go back to God's Word. If reference to Shalomaker or Barth or by way of comparison or contrast helps us understand the Scriptures, then by all means let us quote him. But the Bible is the final authority. That is why in the final analysis, systematic theology should be exegetical. Whatever else it does, it must set forth the teaching of Scripture first and foremost. My own mentor in this respect is John Murray under whom I studied at Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia. His article on the nature of systematics is well worth reading, and his method of teaching is a model for us all. When I was in college, Christian friends warned me against studying Reformed theology because they thought it was too focused on philosophy and not sufficiently focused on Scripture. 
Well, that concern was a caricature, and John Murray shattered him. Whenever he taught a doctrine in his systematics course, he would spend almost the whole time going methodically through the biblical data. That convinced me that the Reformed faith is true. When I read books of other theologians, often I am not convinced. In those writers, uh, G.C. Burkauer is an example, there's so much space devoted to history and contemporary thought that the biblical witness is overshadowed. So I urge you to use all the tools available to you, languages, ancient history, history of theology and culture, traditional and modern theology. But remember that your ultimate goal as a theologian is to expound Scripture, Scripture alone, sola scriptura. This has been Wayne Conrad with Good Shepherd Church. God bless you.